Future Cash Show. Brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam. Good morning, Tony. Great having you here. Good morning, Felix. Thanks for having me on the show. We have many, many problems that we have to solve in the coming 20 to 30 years, that's for sure. For some reason, I think food is a doable issue. Do you agree? I agree. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that, you know, there's, there's more than enough technologies coming into the food space now um, that's going to enable us to address a lot of the issues that, that we've got. We know that food is a big contributor, along with many other things, to greenhouse gas emissions and you know, various other impacts on climate and sustainability. But I do think that we have the tools that we need to do something about this. I mean, I, I am a bit of a, at least from the food point of view, I'm a bit of a techno utopian from that point of view, not maybe from political social techno utopian, but from the point of view of how we can reimagine our food system to address a lot of the upcoming issues. I think that um, that's certainly where I would consider myself something of, of a techno utopian in that sense. Yep, so I think, I mean, they, there's a very good set of um, goals in the SDGs. And I think the, as they say, the devil's in the detail in translating those into how we're actually going to get there from a food point of view. And they seem to have a, a particular slant on how it will be solved, same as the World Resources Institute. Um, which is not um, something that I necessarily agree is going to work. So if we look at some of the SDGs, it's in terms of, you know, how do we um, look at people eating less? How do we have less food waste? How do we do all these things, which while they're really great goals in their own right, when I look at that from what I think is a realistic point of view, I don't know it's going to have the effect that it's that's required and certainly not, not quick enough. If we look at the fact that the SDGs and World Resource Institute all say about we need to cut food waste, we need to cut food waste. Food is so cheap in industrialized countries. If we throw out a bag of apples or half a bag of potatoes or you know some meat doesn't get used, do we really care? No, we're at some of the lowest um, percentages of income for food that we've ever seen in the history of mankind. So the incentive to actually waste less, unless it's from an ethical and moral perspective, is really simply not there. And people like the World Resources Institute say, what we need to do is for the people who eat too much to eat less, and we send that somewhere else. And I look at that and go, We've been telling people to eat less so that they don't die of lifestyle diseases. We've been telling them that for decades. How's that working for you? It's not working. So that to me is an unrealistic goal. It's a laudable goal. And should we try it? Maybe. But should we waste a lot of resources on doing that? My view is no. And if we look at what happened under COVID, um, then we see again some cracks in that viewpoint of redistributing food because to grow food, you need two major inputs. You need arable land and you need fresh water. Now, if you have both of those, you can produce lots of food and many countries, industrialized countries have that and they can grow lots of food. If you have less of one or the other, you're very restricted in your ability to grow your own food and to achieve some sort of food security. So what I say from a technological point of view is we need to redistribute the means of production because we can, to a great extent, decouple arable land and fresh water from food production. So why I say that is you can have technologies that use virtually no arable land whatsoever. In the middle of a desert with solar energy, you can grow biomass. Companies like Solar Foods, Air Protein, you can do that. 
They use very small amounts compared to um, traditional agriculture of fresh water. So there you've got a technology that no longer tied to those twin tyrannies of food production. And they can be done locally. Now we saw as again in the pandemic, some countries in Europe stopping export of their crops. It was only for a few weeks. It didn't cause mass global starvation. Nothing happened there. So it was relatively resilient, but it did show that in a crisis, countries with food will look after themselves first. And the rest of the world that can't do that is simply going to have to just wear it. They're going to have to take what they can get. And if we were to have even bigger major disruptions in global trade, um, the impact would be just absolutely in enormous. So that's why I see this redistribution of product, telling people to eat less and redistribute what they don't eat and grow more in the countries that can grow it and send it elsewhere, really is not the best solution to the problem that we've got. We look at everywhere, it's all about, all about health. And I think one of the things though that we're learning about health is that how absolutely individual our responses are to food. And I think the days of the blanket diets, even the blanket Mediterranean diet, which doesn't actually work for absolutely everyone, it's simply the best diet that we know that's got a reasonable, statistically valid um, testing to say that it is most beneficial, is that there's some interesting work being done in the, the Wiseman Institute in Israel, and they fed a group of people all exactly the same food. So you and I figure it's good. Each have a piece of chocolate. Your blood glucose does nothing. Mine goes through the roof. You eat an apple, which should be healthy for you. Your blood glucose goes through the roof. Mine doesn't. So that's how individual our responses are. So you're lucky. You should eat chocolate. I should eat apples now, you know, depends on your definition of lucky. But, um, and so that looking at that personalization of food is going to be very, very important because as I say, the blanket diets simply don't work. Um, you know, whether that's the keto, paleo, whatever diet it is, it simply is not the right diet for, for everyone. And if we can isolate the causes of that change in our responses to food and therefore our nutrition, I think that's going to be a great advance for people and enable people to hone in on the food that's actually good for them. I, I suspect still eating lots of plant-based, small amounts of meat, small amounts of other products is still going to be basically there, but there is going to be a much finer definition of what's actually right for, for people's health. Okay, let's talk about the elephant. Climate change. I mean, look, we, we see all sorts of figures as to the, um, the percentage impact of food and agriculture on, on the planet, depending how you measure it and what we do. But I think what's indisputable is the food system does have a major impact, whether you want to call it 14% or 18% or 20%, it's got a major impact on the planet. And if we have a look at some of, again, these, these new technologies, when you start using um, less resources to manufacture these products, then the overall global uh, greenhouse gas emissions are going to be a, a lot less. So I think that a lot of these technologies that we've got are also going to enable us to produce food with a lot less impact on the planet. If we look at things like the, the cultivated meat, where you just take that biopsy from an animal and you can grow the, the animal cells in, in, in fermenters, all of the data that I've seen um, certainly says, A, a lot less land, a lot less water. Now, whether the greenhouse gas emissions are 90% less or 50% less, I think even, even if it's the lower number of 50, that's still a huge change in the greenhouse gas emissions from that part of the industry. So I think that looking at some of those technologies is definitely going to have a much lower impact on the planet. And as we know, if we look at um, the feed rates that we need to produce animal protein versus consuming plant protein, 
then we can certainly see that there's less intensive um, agriculture required to produce the original feed material in plants rather than have to turn that into, in, 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 into animals. So I think that there's some of these technologies will definitely reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, we're not going to get rid of a lot of the current sources of greenhouse gas emissions, particularly animal agriculture for a long time. I mean, if animals stopped eating animals tomorrow, a lot of people would starve to death because there's simply not enough protein available to compensate for the loss of animals. You can't simply eat the corn that you fed to the animals. That's simply not going to work. There needs to be a rebalancing of the food system. And I think that's what will happen over the decades is we'll see a rebalancing of the food system. If, as is predicted, animal consumption drops over the next decades and these new technologies are more efficient and more effective, um, then we will slowly see displacement. But we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars worth of investment needed to replace a lot of the current animal agriculture. Tony, can you uh, also touch uh, one of my favorite topics uh, about culture? People understanding why we eat what we eat in a particular country or region. When I started looking at the alternative protein space, um, after about 12 months, I, I suddenly said to myself, why, when I imagine a menu for the day, do I think bacon and eggs for breakfast, a ham sandwich for lunch, and steak for dinner? And I realized it was nothing more than the culture I'd grown up with, and the culture around me, and the media, and the marketing that said, this is what to do, and the old, you know, real men eat red meat, one for males, and, um, you know, you've got to get your meat. It's on the, it's on the, it's on the food plate. If we look, food plate, eat meat, eat protein, eat, eat. So we've been told this for a long period of time. And I think until people have that moment when they actually think to themselves, why do I eat how I eat? What are the, what's the reason behind that? And they look at that influence of their culture on what they eat. And some of that culture is actually rather short term. I mean, the amount of animal protein we eat compared to 100 years ago on average is phenomenally different, even over the last four or five decades. So whilst we've got deeply embedded culture in some of the things that we do, others are actually a relatively recent in invention from a cultural perspective. So I think perhaps people questioning the culture, questioning why they think the way they think is going to be a really um, good thing to look forward to in, in the future. Uh, because when people are faced with these new technologies, they're going to have to say to themselves, do I want to eat the product of that technology or not? And it's, it's a very, very complicated um, answer to that question. I think the best example of that is the impossible burger, which is the plant-based burger, which has the soy leg hemoglobin in there that makes the product bleed. Now, if we go and look at that product and we go to their website, the product that makes it bleed is made by genetically modified yeast. And they're upfront, transparent. We use genetically modified yeast. They also use genetically modified soybeans. Now, if someone came to you and said, I've got this great new product, I'm going to use genetically engineered organisms to make the component, I'm going to use genetically engineered soy, and I'm going to sell it to people. Would you advise them to go ahead on that project? Probably I wouldn't have. I, would, I don't know that I would have gone like, oh, that's a real winner. But hey, people are buying as much as impossible can make. Because people are multifactorial in their decision making. And they look at it, well, okay, it's in Burger King. I eat a Burger King all the time. Burger King's a big corporation. They probably wouldn't want to poison me because I don't want to kill their customers. The government says it's okay. It's got some advantages in greenhouse gas emissions and maybe health and things like that. That's what I can see. And they weigh it up and they buy as much of that product as impossible can make. So really, really interesting example to me of how, when you looked at the product, you'd probably say, 
don't waste your money on that. Don't waste your money putting tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into that company. No one's going to buy a genetically modified product. It's just not, not going to happen. But it is. So I, I find that extremely interesting. And, you know, how culture feeds into that. Um, I, I don't know the answer to it, but I just find that one of the most interesting examples that I've seen having been in the food industry for 30 plus years of a product that's come onto the market that really had a lot of things against it and it's done extremely well. And, and I think the other thing with that is, of course, how, who does that technology appeal to? Because a lot of the research around is showing us that younger generations, Gen Zs and millennials are much more open to transparent technology in their food. I mean, we've always had technology in our food. I mean, the best example of that is cheese. Now, cheese used to use the fourth stomach of a two-day-old dead calf, clean it and put it in the milk and make cheese. Now, even they realised back in the 80s that that wasn't going to fly for much longer, people weren't going to put up with it. So what did they do? They genetically engineered some organisms to make chymosin, the primary enzyme in rennet from calf stomachs, and they did that in 1992. Our friends at Pfizer did that. And that has been used for 30 years. People eating hard cheeses in industrialized countries around the world are most likely eating a product made with a product of a genetically modified organism have been for 30 years. Now, everyone I've told that to, and I said, well, you're gonna stop eating cheese? They go, no. <laughs> so, you know, there are some things around that. There's a story to be told around these things. Um, that becomes part of our culture. And the other cultural thing I find intriguing is drinking cow's milk. And when you think about it, drinking cow's milk is a bizarre thing to do. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it is bizarre. What we do is we say, cow, you're making milk for your young, for your calf. Now we're gonna say, no, we're gonna stop you doing that and even though you're a different species, we're going to all drink the milk from your species and not from our own or from plants or anything. I mean, I just, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing to do. I mean, I've just, I finished, just finished a cup of coffee with milk in, so dairy milk in it, so I'm not making any judgments on that. I'm just saying those, these sorts of things, when you question the culture, and we all know why we drink cow's milk and why we have lactase persistence, because in Europe, in cold weather, particularly being able to metabolize the lactose in cow's milk was a survival advantage, which is why populations around the world, like Australia and the US, high lactase persistent because of European origins. So that's why. So there was a survival advantage. But today, we just do it because we've always done it. But now don't never, ever question the culture behind what we do. I think that if we look at the developing countries, developing countries now have a choice. Do I copy the industrialized agriculture of developed countries or do I go down my own path? Do I look at some of these things and say, what's best for my country? Is it growing a conventional cattle herd and cattle industry and feed industry? I think it goes with it and doing that. Or do I look to new technologies which may have less environmental impact, more sustainable that I can use in my own country. I mean, if we look at some of the other technologies, even things like algae, I mean, there's nothing magical about where we get our protein from, plants and animals. We can just as easily get it from mycoprotein, which is protein from mushroom type like, -like products. Um, so, we can get it from that. We can get it from algae, which yes, technically plants, but we can get from all different sources. We're no longer tied to large monocultures of things like corn or things like wheat or rice. And if your rice is an interesting one, they're now looking at rice that will grow in seawater. And that's good for two reasons. You don't need the fresh water. And rice is a very, very potent methane producing crop. So it contributes a lot to global warming. So if you could grow your rice in seawater, hey, hey, suddenly I don't need, um, 
that don't need fresh water. And if I'm growing near the coast, which a lot of it is grown near the coast, and it's been overtaken by salt water, you've got a solution there. So I think there's, um, you know, looking at uh, looking at that side of things is is very, very interesting um, as well. Excellent. Um, now let's switch to our audience and please address a wish, your personal wish you would like to share with our audience. I think the what I would like people to do is to consider these new technologies in balance and look at the benefits they're going to bring and to look at it from the point of view of how it's going to contribute and help to feeding the world. At the moment, a lot of the uh, projections are we're going to lose something like 10% of our crop yields by 2050. And we know we're going to increase the population by 25%. And that doesn't even take into account growing middle classes. We need to look at these technologies and say, hey, these technologies are going to be required if we are going to feed the world and feed them sustainably and equitably. And that it would be very, very nice if everybody decided to eat less, get healthier, not get diabetes and everything else. But in the event that that's not going to happen, which I don't quite think it will, not certainly not quick enough, that people have a look at these technologies and say, hey, can we look at these in a rational way? I think that politics, unfortunately, is going to get in the way of a lot of these things. But we have enough countries in the world which don't have entrenched interests who are going to take up a lot of these technologies. Now, Saudi Arabia has no cattle herd to protect. So if they decide to become the minced meat capital of the world and put 500 billion into the industry, they will do it. So with the globalization of technologies, the flow of technologies and money, money will go where it's required, where the profit is. And I think that that's the thing. No country is in isolation anymore. You mean us from Australia, where I'm from here, we, we grow enough food for 70 million people with a population of about 24, 25 million people. So we've got a large export agriculture industry. And if we don't keep up with the technologies and someone else gets cheaper than us, we're going to lose a lot of our GDP. And I think a lot of these countries that don't have entrenched interests and these technologies available, they take up places like Singapore, UAE in particular, Saudi as well. If they take up these new technologies, they can change the face of the food system in the world. And we really need to reimagine our food system in light of what's achievable now, not what was achievable even 10, 20 or 100 years ago. If we don't do that and we don't accept some of these technologies, then I think we are really we're in some real trouble and global strife over food in the next 20 to 30 years, Felix. I think with the technologies at our fingertips, there is a lot that we're going to achieve in the next 30 years to feed everybody sustainably and equitably. Now, if we look at food, food is now becoming technology. Technology grows exponentially. It's what I call food is now tech exponential. And if we look at the rate at which these technologies are growing and the ability these technologies have to address the food problems, whether it be growing enough food or feeding people, I think we've got an amazing arsenal of technologies at our disposal, which will enable us to feed the planet by 2050, whether we reach nine and a half or 10 billion people. As I pointed out at the start, I am a bit of a techno utopian. And I really think that applying technologies is going to help us address the pressing problems that we've got from sustainability, greenhouse gas emissions, and feeding the planet. So I am definitely a techno-utopian optimist, Felix. Fantastic, Tony. I love it. And I hope to hear from you soon again. Yep. Thanks um, very much, Felix. Thanks for the opportunity to be on the show.